the reason why I do well in negotiating for our buyers is... So the big question is, what are top agents doing to absolutely crush it in real estate, grow their teams and add more transactions year over year while so many struggle? To get the answers, we interview top real estate agents to learn their secrets to success. Listen, we believe every agent should make a minimum of $100,000 per year, and we're on a mission to make this happen. We've already helped over 100 agents achieve this with our coaching. So if you want to fast track your business growth, get to your first $100,000 in GCI or add another $100,000 in GCI using social strategies, then head over to go.eliteagentsecrets.com or you can just click the link in the description below. Also, just make sure to follow us, hit that subscribe button, and if you get any value from this at all, please tell a friend and leave us a review. My name is Andrew Dunn. And my name is Peter Michael. Welcome to Elite Agent Secrets. So, your third topic is the whole pre-listing process. Now, I know this is a big one for you. This is the one where you're like, this could take like an hour. Like I teach this all the time. Um, so the pre-listing process that's you know allowed you to basically earn a lot more money from your sellers and get deals closed even faster. So let's get into it. Let's break down how people listening can get their home sold for above ask and quick. Oh, absolutely. It's a great topic. So today in this market, I mean, you could put a sign on the lawn and buyers will come. Right. And you almost wonder what is the need of a realtor? <clears throat> if we're talking about the averages of realtors, you might actually be doing yourself a disservice and probably you should for sale by owner, uh, get an attorney and call it a day. Right. Um, but for those of us who are into strategizing and uh, having systems around this, uh, it is certainly a proven result that we do get more money for our clients with less aggravation. So here in Pennsylvania, we are a title state, which means that we do all the negotiating. Uh, we execute on contracts and there is no attorney review. We don't have the three day attorney process. We have none of that. Right. Um, so with that, what I believe uh, sets us apart is the fact that while I am not an attorney, nor do I play one on TV, um, I certainly do perform as one, which what I mean by that is I'm not dictating to my clients what they should do. Right. I educate them and I protect them. And they'll often hear me say things like, look, I'm going to advise you the best that I can but my own kids don't listen to me and I don't expect you to, right? This is not a dictatorship. I'm not going to tell you how this is going to go. I'm going to explain to you what's going on in the market. So for one, uh, and this part, this process uh, has been for me about more than five years now where I do highly encourage sellers to perform pre-home inspections on their property. Now, that is not a common thing in my area. I do know in some states like California, uh, it actually, and, and not even all of California, but there are pockets in which it is very customary to do so. So across states, you will find pockets where it has become the norm and the thing. Here in Pennsylvania, in Chester County, it is not, right? So one of the things that I hear often when on a listing appointment and I start explaining the process and, and what are the things that we need to do to get the home ready for market, and I encourage the pre-home inspection, the uh, objection from the average seller today is, why would I do that? I met with so-and-so agent and they said, that's a terrible idea. Uh, most buyers in today's market waive the inspection contingency period. Why would I spend the money or time? And then I'd have to disclose it, right? So I do <laughs> chuckle. When I hear that, I hear it often. And my response pretty much is, I'm curious to know, did they also share with you that in the last year, there's been a 40% increase in mediation request by buyers who are, well, the whole 40% is not in specifically inspections, but there's absolutely been um, an increase uh, year over year and more so this year, because what happens, you do have buyers who are desperate. They do waive the inspection contingency period. Uh, it's like a weekend in Vegas. They are above asking. They're giving their next born child. I mean, they're just ridiculous. The terms that are being created. Uh, they move in two months later, the heating and air conditioning uh, break, right? 
Uh, they defer back to the seller's disclosure and they're like, wait a minute, why didn't they tell us that they had uh, the heating guy out here twice in the last year? Because we ironically called the same heating service and they shared with us the history, right? And that the sellers knew. And now we feel like they should have disclosed that. And rightfully so, they should have disclosed it if they knew uh, that there was a problem. So we have a 10 page seller's disclosure where the seller's elect yes, no, unknown. And the reality is that even the most honest of homeowners don't remember, right? Something that is wrong or happened, or they don't know that they have mold in the attic or whatever it may be, right? They could be very well unaware of a situation, but because it's been ongoing, uh, there certainly is a point to be made by the buyer to say, you should have known and you did not disclose. Right. So my question simply is, look, if you're looking for me to simply sell your home, I get it. If you're looking for me to protect your best interest beyond the closing table, if this were my home, this is what I would do. And I'm not asking you to correct the found issues. Now, if there's something alarming that I think would put off the average buyer, absolutely. We want to get ahead of it. But all the other stuff, all we're doing is attaching it to the seller's disclosure and saying, look, Now you know everything more than I knew about my own home. Now you know. And what I will tell you that in the last couple of years, I can't remember the last time a home inspector, a second one, uh, came into one of my properties. Seldom, if ever, um, do my sellers need to accept an offer uh, that is based on inspection contingency period. And let me just also say, why the sellers like it, and and even when there aren't pre-inspections, why the seller would choose uh, an offer where it's waived over another offer is not because they really think you're going to find things that they either don't want to share or don't know about. It is that you're you're a higher risk buyer in the sense that sellers today don't only want the highest price. They want the best terms. They want the least amount of contingencies. They want to know that when we accept your offer today, you are going to make it to the settlement table, right? Because they've got somewhere to be. They've got costs involved. And if that journey doesn't happen the way they expect, that's a loss of money, right? And time and aggravation. So the more contingencies we can have waived in an agreement of sale with the highest price, the more likely your offer is to be uh, accepted. Right. So, and I have a question for you. When mm-hmm. you're crafting a strong offer or when you're looking and reviewing offers for your sellers, you know, the least is always the best. But how can, like, when you have an offer in front of you, what makes that offer stand out? Do you care about the deposit being higher, yes. the inspection yes. period being shorter? Yes. Uh, like, everybody who's, everybody who's listening, whether they're a brand new agent or seasoned agent, I want to make sure that they understand that as a seasoned agent, what are you looking at specifically? Because if you have 15 or 20 offers, how yeah, can I make my non-desirable FHA offer stand out uh, next to a conventional or maybe even cash offer? Right. Okay. So let's talk about cash offers. Um, Cash offers are not generally cash, right? Um, My average price point is in the 500,000 range. Uh, Generally speaking, uh, those of us who can purchase a home with the liquidity of um, aren't dumb enough to liquidate $500,000. Right. I would much rather. Hopefully. You know, I'm either going to get financing and put 20 or more percent down, or I'm going to borrow against my self-directed IRA, or, you know, I'm going to have an equity line on another property that's going to give me that liquidity, whatever it may be. So to be clear, in the state of Pennsylvania, and again, so you've got to know your contracts and your state and, and how it operates. We have a mortgage contingency period. You either elect it or you waive it. In waiving it, that does not mean you are not getting financing. It simply means that your your offer is not contingent on you getting financing, right? So you absolutely still can apply for, and and I hear this all the time from listing agents. They get all pissy uh, because now an appraisal is being ordered, 
And uh, they're like, wait a minute, you weighed, you know, you, you're a cash offer. No, nowhere on there do, do you elect cash, right? You're basically just waiving or you are electing and you're putting in their conventional FHA, VA, whatever it may be. So I've purchased properties myself often where I waive um, the mortgage contingency period, but I absolutely am getting financing, right? So if I'm 100% certain that that money is going to show up by way of either that mortgage company or I'll take a penalty and liquidate something or whatever it may be, I'm taking that responsibility. So why does that become better? Well, think about it. If I list a home for 500000 we've got 20 plus offers. It's now escalated to five seventy five, even 600000 right? It's not unusual to be more than 10% over in that price point, right? Because also the price points uh, determine what percentage generally we get higher than, than the asking. But let's just say in this scenario, it's a $500,000 ask price. Uh, the bulk of the 20 something offers are hovering around the 550 mark. That's usually how it goes there. Then you've got your top tier offers. They're around 575, maybe even as high as 600. Now, what's going to be the differentiator? Which one is ab absorbing any potential appraisal shortage and can prove so and or waiving the mortgage contingency? Because when you waive it, I don't care that you have an appraiser coming you are accepting the fact that whatever it appraises for, whatever happens with your financing, you are still showing up to settlement at that agreed upon price, right? So as far as initial deposit, I'm shocked that I still see every now and again, agents who are writing in $1,000 for initial deposit, right? And then 9,000 for a second. First off, you waived inspections. And then they even put in ridiculousness like second deposit, within 24 hours of, of agreed upon and spent like what year is this, right? We don't do that anymore. Plus I'm not going to come chasing after you and even bothering to remember. I mean, not, I have someone who, who uh, manages my timelines, but um, to go find you for a second deposit. And if we're talking about a half million up, what number is going to pain you? Now, I know that more often than ever, you're going to get your deposit money back. If the buyer decides in the state of Pennsylvania that they want out of this contract, it's likely that they will get their deposit money back. What I've done, however, is I've tied up your money. So if you are a buyer who is providing great terms to the seller, you're 50 plus thousand over asking, do not think that an initial deposit of $5,000 is going to do it. Because at $5,000, if the neighbor's house comes on market, you will walk away for a half million plus buyer, you will walk away from 5,000 to make an offer on another house. You'll think twice on 50,000, right? And you may get that 5000 back or you may not, depending on where you're at in the contract and what's going on. But if that other house is really exciting to you, there's a dollar amount that you're going to walk away from to get what you want. And so that's how I determine what amount I want for initial deposit. I also want it within two days, not five, which is what's stated in our contract, because our MLS requires that we update the status within three days, right? How often do you see in your markets where the um, property goes back on market? You've never seen that on one of my listings, right? So if by chance the buyer, you know, we execute and they're delivering the deposit, uh, let's say if I didn't change it to two days and they had five days and it's the fourth day and I've already changed it in the MLS as under contract without even the deposit money in hand, right? And they have buyer's remorse because it happens, right? They're like, wow, this really got crazy. What did I just do? And they don't deliver the deposit. Well, I've got 20 other buyers waiting in the wing to negotiate with that before we even change the status, you know, we terminate that one, we accept another one and we move on. You'll never, almost never, I won't say never, there was one in the last two years um, that did terminate after the fact. Seldom ever will you see one of my listings go back on market. Because Do you feel like going back on market does hurt the property a little yeah. bit? Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Buyers want what they can't have. And when someone else wanted it and then threw it away, buyer becomes skeptical. Skeptical. Yeah. Because I know the first thing that I ask is like, why is this property back on the market? Of course you do. Right. And then it's, I know it's probably, you know, you're answering the same freaking question all the time, you know, financing or this or that. But I just went through, I just, I'm going through this myself right now. Property was listed for $399. We put in a very strong offer. They are FHA buyers. We put it at 420. They have the cash. You know, obviously there's some unknowns on why they're doing the FHA that I can't, you know, properly disclose, but knowing what the FHA product is, um, you know, they're just sitting on a lot of cash that they can't necessarily maybe show or or put in. So We'd love to hear your feedback on this because I'm sure people are, you know, in the same boat as I am sometimes where properties looks like, you know, out of out of the catalog for what you can get for 400 grand. Right. Okay. Just to kind of put things in perspective. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's great. It's kind of cool. It's on the you're lane. The agent or you're the buyer agent? I am the buyer's agent. Okay. The listing agent, first of all. I, this guy's a ghost. Got 600 some reviews on the internet. Can't get a hold of him. I try to contact the team. I'm getting through like a VA to a VA or cyber backer, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Basically, everybody that I don't want to talk to because I need to talk to this guy to paint the picture of why my client deserves to win this property, right? Yeah. Eventually, I kind of get through. And I was prepared to even give this client to them and say, hey, dude, take the 6%. I just need to get these guys in the house. They're really close friends of mine. Mm-hmm. You know. So at this point, for me, it's not about the money. It's about getting them into the right property. Okay. Property comes on within two hours. I, I message them, hey, I hate giving, you know, property, um, you know, get, getting, giving you a contract without seeing it sight unseen. I know it's frowned upon. Would you still like me to submit one? I know you're doing an open house. Oh, I'm sorry. You're doing showings on Saturday. It's Friday. He goes, yeah, go ahead. Submit. So we submitted 410, seven and a half K within three days of going on the contract, seven and a half K after the inspection day period of seven days. Right. Mm-hmm. So We'd love to hear your feedback, what your thoughts are on on doing something like that. In order to win as an FHA buyer today, and every once in a blue moon, my sellers have uh, accepted an FHA buyer. Look, I was a loan officer before I was a realtor. I have no problem with FHA financing. So for the first hurdle you have. Thank you. (laughs) It's just educating the other party because nine nine out of 10 times, they don't even understand why an FHA versus conventional, it's still guaranteed money. Of course. There's there so may be a little bit of hiccups hurdles. and different intricacies, but yeah. it's still money. You've got, a, you've got a few hurdles with the listing agent. First off, no offense, and I'm going to offend some people, but any listing agent who's listing a home at three ninety nine, I'm already making some, you know, judgments about them. Right. In that, you know, what year is this? Again, how do buyers buy homes? How do they find them? Right. It. <laughs> Why on earth would you list a home today for three ninety nine and not four hundred? Why would you lose out on the four to five hundred thousand dollar buyer pool if they're searching online? Where do you see any one website? Name one that has a minimum and a maximum of three ninety nine and not four hundred. They just simply don't, right? So Thank you, you. All- <laughs> right? So I already have you know questions about this listing agent. Uh, then I want to understand, you know, who they are and do a little research, you know, whether you, whatever MLS you use, or if you got home snap or whatever it is that you can, uh, look up an agent at a glance just to get a feel. Do they list in this area often? Right. Um, again, assuming you all don't already know this list agent, right. Uh, for me, the value to my team, while I personally don't work with buyers, I'm constantly negotiating buyer offers for my team with the listing agent that I already have a relationship with. Now, there's probably about three I can think of off the top of my head. If I thought long, it'd probably be five agents that I absolutely cannot stand uh, in my market. And in those cases, there's only three or four. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I right? probably have two handfuls by now, and shit, right? I've been doing this for a few months. <laughs> yeah, I, I think my stats are pretty good. I mean, considering you know that there's uh, well in the state, what are we up to forty thousand or something agents? I don't know exactly how many are in my county or MLS, but nonetheless, right? I think my ratios are pretty good, actually, considering I'm pretty transparent, and you know, you'd think more people wouldn't like me, but anyway, unless they just smile at me and act like they like me. Anyway, um, the point is, is I, I first want to make sure that uh, I've got a listing agent who understands financing, right? When I submit my offer, I absolutely would copy your lender on there, right? Check. I do that. And then I always have them actually call the listing agent after I submit the offer to plead the case or sure. whatever it may be, whether it's a conventional FHA. I would suggest that they reply all. Um, okay. That, the, that you train them to look, I'm going to start copying you on here with the pre-approval and all. And I would love for you to reply all to verify everything I just said regarding their financing. Right. So in your case, you know, it's probably credit score or some other uh, reason where the FHA guidelines were just more conducive for this buyer. But you also mentioned that liquidity is not really their problem. That's the best FHA buyer uh, when it's really not a cash problem. It's a credit score problem. And that's, it's exa and that's exactly what it is. It's, okay. it's more so the credit side, right? Mm -hmm. And we ended up basically giving 20K over ask seven day inspection, the guy is a GC. So like we already knew like what we're getting in on the property. But you elected inspection. We did elect the inspection, yeah. So how many offers did not? Well, and that's the thing, I didn't have any context because I could never speak to the agent that was actually going to be presenting the offers and the- That's VA. a shitty agent, quite honestly. Right. Yeah, because if I can get into an agent, like I had another deal that closed at the beginning of the year where the agent held off us requesting appraisal for three weeks so the new FHA guidelines can actually take effect so we can yeah. actually buy the house, right? Mm -hmm. They waited until January yeah. 3rd mm -hmm. for us to make sure that the lending system had the update so then we could request the appraisal because they went from like 405 to 460 and we were pre-approved for 450 and that's what the deal was going down for. And they were willing to work with me. And she goes, listen, you weren't the highest. You definitely weren't the best. I liked you the most. You had the most favorable terms. You presented your buyers. I just liked the way you rolled. And it's like, to me, as long as I can get in front of the person, just tell me what they're looking for. And other than as much money as possible, because that's what everybody's looking for. That's a given. Right. right. I'm not lowballing you. I'm coming out of the gate. I'm giving you 420, seven day inspection, 15 G's well, in the are you giving 420? So in your offer, did you um, absorb any potential appraisal shortage? I did. I gave him a 10 K appraisal gap because okay. based on everything that I've done, mm -hmm. um, like doing a comp, a CMA and all of the property and everything, I was very, very confident that this thing is appraising between 420 425, 430 is really just pushing it for this area specifically. So, so 10K, if you are very confident, think about what you're saying. It's well, listed at 399. You went to 420 and you're only absorbing a 10K gap. Why not a 20K gap? Because I couldn't get my buyer sign off on it. That so, that's that was my biggest hurdle. I said, hey, listen, like I don't think this is gonna be an issue. Here's the comps, here's the analysis. Let's up it. He goes, mm -hmm. that's a yeah. little beyond my comfort zone. I said, all right. There's only so much why, that I can I, point. So here's, here's the thing. I love a win-win situation, right? Uh, and I believe why I'm able to get deals done is because I spend more time negotiating with my buyer. When I say my buyer, right? So the team brings uh, a situation to me. I get on the phone with the buyers and my, my team member, Right. And I do more negotiating with them before reaching out to the listing agent, explaining things, right? So what out of pocket are you willing to concede to, to actually get this house? And what is the cost involved to your current situation? Every month that goes by that you're not in a home, what is that cost, right? You know, it sounds is like it, music to my ears because I know I'm doing the right thing because exactly right. what you're talking right. about, because they were like, no, we're going at 399. I'm like, 
in this world, in this market, I'm not even writing, you know, I'm not even going to show you this house because we're going to be both wasting each other's time. We're either coming in at 420 or we're not entertaining this thing at all. They were like mm-hmm. I, 410. I said, listen, 410 is the initial. Let's go see the house. You're going to give me a 420 by the end of the day. Yeah. Finally, reluctantly, he agreed. I said, listen, you can't lose on this. Mm-hmm. However, like if they want some transaction fees that are going to be three, four, five hundred 500 bucks, fuck it. Let's just give it to them. Right. Like <laughs> you have to understand that your offer against the conventional for some reason is not weighted the same. So we have to make this thing like with a bow, like a red bow on top of it. So, so what's your transfer it? tax in your area? What do this, do the sellers and buyers each pay um, a transfer tax? <clears throat> they do. Yeah. What percentage? Um, I think it's 0.05. Wow. So it's 1% transfer tax here on each side, right? Yeah. Uh, and a buyer could elect to pay both sides of the transfer tax. Interesting. I haven't even thought about that. Mm-hmm. So you have to look at your seller's net cost. So what I do for my sellers, uh, one of the recent properties, so to put it in perspective for you, uh, listed in the low six, we executed in the low sevens, right? Waived mortgage, uh, waived inspections, again, pre-inspections, it happens all the time. This particular seller got a four-month lease back for free, right? So the yeah. average rent in that area for that home would have been about $3,000 a month. So on top of everything else, right, they've got $12,000 worth of cost that didn't happen. And the cost of moving twice because they needed to stay in their home until July, Um, all of it, all these costs. So when you think about it, that was an exceptionally stellar, stellar situation. And I'm always, as a listing agent, I'm always thinking of my seller's bottom line. So if I know that I sell their home for whatever, they've got whatever commission we negotiated, they've got their 1% transfer tax, they've got some other junk fees, whatever. Um, So I know what their bottom line number is. The reason why I do well in negotiating for our buyers is because I'm thinking like a listing agent, right? And I'm thinking about what the seller really wants at the end of the day. They want the most solid guarantee that you're not only making this offer today, that you are showing up to that settlement table with the same offer, not the the roll down game. So if you genuinely believe that that house, the comp suggests to you that any appraiser, drunk or otherwise, showing up to that home today would appraise it for 420, right? Then you had to be at least 425 or higher, even to just be in the game. I have to imagine, right? So, so first off, I would show them the comps and let them believe it and say, based on these three, and they may have even made an offer on one of them and didn't get it, right? So we know that those homes are in the past. That's history. Where is this going, guys? Do you see where the market's going? What's happening? And this is all market specific. In my area, you you put a house under contract today, and it's just a given that the next house is going to be priced higher without that even being a comp yet because it hasn't sold. And when we go under contract here, the agreed upon price is not public, not until it closes. Right. Yeah. So, same here. And I love I love the feedback that you're giving me because it shows that I'm in the right game. Mm-hmm. The only variable is making sure that I get in front of the listing agent. If I can get in front of the listing agent, I can literally find out um, what's client. important to them. Because it's not yeah. it's not only just as much as possible. It's the bottom line, like you're saying, like the net. Right. Like what are they looking to walk away from? Are they looking for a longer close? Are they looking for a post closing occupancy? Are they, you know, are they looking for a more aggressive inspection? Like, how are we going to guarantee that this thing is going to close? It's going to be on time. It's not going to cost them any extra money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to figure out like how to make the FHA offer stand out and just making just making sure that I'm aggressive, but at the same time, not putting my clients at a disadvantage where it blows back. Yeah. At the same time, it's like it's a, it's really an art, right? Oh, sure. You don't want to open them up um, to some unforeseen things where now all of a sudden, you know, 
the, the good thing is we went and like I got the insurance quote the moment we started putting in an offer. And the insurance, we ended up finding out that this house and the house next door, for some odd reason, were in a high risk flood zone, which would have made their insurance bill instead of fifteen hundred or two grand a year, like six grand. So now on the premise of them qualifying for a loan, me knowing the insurance risks, I can't do well. Yeah. Did you, convey do that? Did you convey that to the seller? Because if they don't uh, to the listing agent, because if they don't have a mortgage, they may not even have like they're only required to have flood insurance by the mortgage company. Now, it'd be foolish for a homeowner to not have flood insurance in a flood zone. Yet it's not uncommon for a seller who does not have a loan to also not have flood insurance or they've got some you know, grandfathered in, uh, whatever it may be, right? I would, oops, sorry. I would certainly uh, make it aware to them that we've already done our due diligence. We already got a quote for insurance, which I hope that you're also asking the insurance agent if there's have been any claims on the property in the last couple of years, right? So you want to know about that as well, right? So communicating to them because that seller may not know that. And why would they need to know? Well, they're going to definitely want to now understand are the other buyers looking at that as well? Because if we accept this other buyer, that's a reason for termination, right? That they found out that the uh, flood insurance was ridiculous, right? Or maybe even reaching out to their insurance company. Maybe they do have that top tier coverage and it's only costing them 3000 whatever it may be, right? But all, doing all that fact finding, that's where it really comes in. But you said something before, um, and and yes, you are on the right track because you feel validated. Like I'm, I'm glad that I'm right, right? Um, but being right doesn't pay the bills, right? Getting getting your client to first understand why this is important to them, not to you, right? And of course, that communication and conveying to the listing agent. And just being able to collaborate with them that they want to work with you. What you never want to be as a buyer agent uh, is right. Listing agents don't give a shit about who's right or wrong, right? It's just, you know, oh, so now already he's coming at me with objection. He's going to be difficult to work with, right? We, we I always tell my client, my agents this, being right does not pay the bills. Like, we've got this saying right. that we, and although it's not oh, so just about to say, yeah, you, you can, can be right, be right or, you can, or be you can be rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this is what we we talk about. You can be right or you can be rich. Yeah. I remember yeah. there was this, I, I can't even remember the argument. And I was just like, just do this. And, and I was like, does it not bother you that you're wrong? And this is when he first said this to me. And he was like, listen, dude, you can be right or you can be rich. Right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. It doesn't help anyone and it creates a push pull, you know, situation and whatever. It's really about communication and getting your buyer to want this more than anything. And what is the cost of not getting it? Right. That's the point. And as far as inspections, if a home is not pre-inspected, we actually do not advise our buyers to waive it, even though so many buyers are doing it. So much so that if they still choose to waive it, uh, we do have them sign a waiver that says we really discourage you from doing that. We can use other uh, tactics. We can shorten the time. We can, you know, the average agent in my area, for some reason, they're fine with deposit checks within five days. So we guarantee that the inspections will be done and responded to before the deposit money is even in hand. Uh, but we can only do that because our inspectors will work on weekends for us if they have to. In in the East, like, you know, we don't ask of that all the time, right? But if the owner of the inspection company that, that we work with a lot had to get out there and do it himself, like he will, right, in those types of circumstances. So we're able to really create um, favorable terms for the seller that put our buyer in position. But with that FHA buyer, just wrapping up with that, um, if liquidity is not his problem, I absolutely would have had them at a slightly higher price if we genuinely believe that it was going to appraise for over that 400 mark. Uh, definitely absorb more, maybe even pay some of the seller's closing costs and even increase the price to do a seller assist in there 
right? So it's kind of becomes a wash for the seller. They're not paying it and the buyer is financing it, right? But that all depends and you have to be specific to their down payment amount. You get all that verified and approved by the lender, right? But you got to think outside of the box, right? You have to make it so tempting and you have to be higher than the conventional and the cash ones, right? Because if you're 20,000 over asking and only absorbing 10, and then you've got a waived mortgage or a 20% down conventional, where it's likely that appraisal may even be waived by the lender, you've got to give me more, right? Because you are slightly more of a risk. And then I have to assume that the house is not, I'm not worried about, you know, any major like lead based paint issues and, you know, all, all these other things that are specifically uh, looked at by FHA appraisers. Assuming we got a decent solid home, as you said, it was, you know, a cream puff of the house. It was really in great shape. Um, so we don't think we have any FHA appraisal regulations that we're worried about. Um, so really, you just got to stand out from that point. So making a higher offer, giving a bigger appraisal gap, as long as they feel comfortable with, is the only way it seems like we are going to even have a chance at getting a house in this market. Yep. And what I want from the lender when he's replying all is I have verified these funds in the worst case scenario, and it only appraises for X. Our appraisal addendums, basically what you put in there is the number in which so long as it comes into this number or more, we are guaranteeing the seller that we're going to make up the difference. <clears throat> and I will tell you in the 400,000 range, I've got the 30, $40,000 appraisal gap uh, coverage by buyers, right? Because again, what is it going to cost them to not be in a home in the next 30 days, 60 days, whatever they weigh that, you know, they see that the market's only going higher. What will it cost to still be at this game 30 days from now, right? So it really depends on the property and it depends on the buyer's wherewithal and a lender who's going to make you look good, right? So I need, for me as a listing agent, when I vet these deals, I do call the lender. I want to know exactly what has been verified. I explain that in this deal, this agent, whether he's explained it right to the buyer or not, he's pretty much saying that not only are they putting 20% down, paying their own closing costs, but the way this is written, and I'm going to get you know that all squared away that it's done correctly uh, per our state rules. Um, are you showing an extra 40000 on top of all that? Can you verify for me in writing? I want an email that says, I verified that if this were to happen, worst case scenario, that these buyers have the liquidity to do so. See, this is so mind blowing that you have to do 20, 30, 40 K appraisal gaps for these properties. You don't have to in my area you do though. No. Cause I, I know your area. That That's my old stomping ground. I used to live in Philly. I actually have family up in Ridgeboro. Uh, so it's fairly close if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Chester County, Chester Springs. This is, you know, the way yeah, Chester to County, Bucks County. It's, you know, yeah. very, very familiar. Got a ton of mm -hmm. friends out there and it's like, but, yeah. but here in Florida, it's like the same thing. Right. Yeah. Like it is like, I'm like trying to figure out different ways of proposing the offers and making mm -hmm. sure my clients stand out because they're just, it's a bloodbath in this price yeah, market. And it's crazy sure. to think about it. Mm -hmm. So going back to the seller real quick, right? Like in the whole preparing the property and advising them correctly. What I also hear a lot from listing agents, oh, the scarcity in the market. I mean, I, I'm still, I'm probably going to do 50 this year as well. it's early in the year, but based on how things are going so far, I see no reason why, I wouldn't do what I last year, did last year. I actually want to reduce uh, my volume by half and have my team do more of the business and attract more agents that I can personally train and bring them up to a level. Um, but I only started thinking this way when, because last year, 100% of all of my personal business was referral based, right? So I didn't take one listing last year that wasn't an actual referral. The rest went to the team. Right. So I figure if I duplicate that again this year, right, that that'll be fine. But why do I why am I even sharing that to you with you um, from the seller's perspective? 
you know, what, what are some of the hangups that, that agents have, uh, getting the listing we're up against this competition. We've got brokerages out here who are charging a flat fee for an $800,000 listing, right? Uh, or they're doing it for considerably fewer apples, right? We're not going to talk about commissions or whatever, right? Um, and, and those quote unquote discount agents, right? You have discount agents in your market? Okay. So A, there's no such thing as a discount agent. In order for there to be we pay it on the front end or the back end, right? Well, no, no, because think about it. What is negotiable uh, in your listing terms? Your commission, your mm-hmm. length of time, right? Uh, there's no standard. So if there's no standard, how could there be a discount? It's what you sure. believe you're worth, what you ask for, right? This is my, you know, this is what I charge. And whether or not the client, the seller, believes you're worth that. Yep. Right. But it's not a standard. Right. And let's be honest. You know, you hate more agents in your market than I do in mine. How many are worth what the averages are paying? Not many. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Just, just a standard that's out there, right? Yeah. So when a seller asks me what my commission is, my question is, what would you like to pay? I actually asked that. I don't know. What would you like to pay? Right. And we, and we pretty much start there. It tells me a lot by their answer, but of course I, I charge what I charge and that's what it is. And, and then, you know, you hear the ones, well, my neighbor, you know, this or that. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're welcome to interview them. You should in fact. Right. And then circle back with me and let me know if, if you're ready to start the process. Because once you know what you know, like, look, if you think you're hiring me to find you a buyer, I'm the first person to tell you I'm grossly overpaid. That is not my only job. I could walk outside and, you know, find you a buyer. Like, there's no work in finding a buyer, right? The work is in protecting your best interest, getting you top dollar, right? And keeping you out of court and and making this whole process simple for you. Well, when we got into this topic, Anna, you said mm-hmm. it was going to be a beast. It's transitioned into a free coaching session. So mm-hmm. I hope all our listeners have enjoyed uh, learning that we're definitely not perfect. And I think the the reality of real estate is the more of the problems you solve, the better agent you become. You shouldn't uh, like you shouldn't hide away from this shit. You should embrace it and be like, I'm going to solve this. Because once you've done it once, you do it again. But with that being said, I want to give you the opportunity now People want to get in touch, learn more about you, whether they want to buy and sell a home in Philly, whether you're growing your team, doing whatever you're doing, whether it's phone, email, socials, website, whatever it is, how can people reach out? The easiest way uh, and memorable is Anna10k.com. That's it. A-N-N-A 10k.com. That will take you to all my social handles. There's a form as a seller to inquire as a buyer. As an agent, if you want to learn more about our brokerage and what we're doing, so that will pretty much get you to everything anywhere at Anna10k.com. That's very efficient. We're not even that efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. Everyone, we hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode and we will see you in the next one. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in gaining access to our course and coaching programs 100% for free, then head over to go.eliteagentsecrets.com.